I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Campfire Talk. This is where we sit around the fire, put our feet up with a cold drink, and let the conversation flow. Uh, Milo's not with us today, he's not feeling well, so he'll be back with us next week. But I wanted to kick this off by something I found this morning that was kind of interesting and I wasn't aware of. But, uh, you know, we've talked about in the past about how our behaviors have been changing and and we're kind of leaving a gap or a void out there around the wilderness areas that we used to be very assertive in. And then not just, you know, the Sasquatch, but other animals are kind of filling in that void. But there's something that might be a little bit more... um, connected with all this or maybe the cause of this stuff and it's been changing for a long long time so there's something that's called domestication syndrome and what what it is and i'll just read it here uh domestication system uh, excuse me domestication syndrome is a term that describes permanent changes that appear in plants and animals as a result of domestication these, uh, these changes make the species different from their wild ancestors in looks and behavior. Some common traits of domestication syndrome in animals are increased docility and tameness, coat color changes, reductions in tr- uh, tooth size, changes in cra- uh, craniofacial morphology, alterations in ear and tail form, more frequent uh, non-seasonal estrocycles, cycles, reductions in brain size. So... Um, and this, this applies to plants as well. So, uh, now domestication syndrome is not the same as taming, which is the behavioral modification of a wild born animal that reduces its natural, natural avoidance of humans. And they go on to talk about, um, other species pairs show similar differences. Bonobos like chimpanzees are a close genetic cousin to humans. But unlike the chimpanzees, bonobos are not aggressive and do not participate in lethal intergroup aggression or kill within their own group. Most distinctive features of a bonobo are its cranium, which is 15% smaller than a chimpanzee's. It's less aggressive and more playful behavior. Um, And then it goes on to talk about some different animals and uh, trait differences, but... Um, more do- now this is interesting too. More docile animals have been found to have less testosterone in their than their more aggressive counterparts, and testosterone controls aggression and brain size. One researcher has argued that becoming more social, we humans have developed a smaller brain than those of humans 20,000 years ago. Now, what's interesting about that, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, let's see. It says, in 2017, a researcher proposed that humans show the same domestication syndrome traits that can be found in other domesticated animals, which supports the theory of human self-domestication. Um, so, you remember, guys, we've talked about Danny Vendermini's book, Them and Us, and Vendermini, in a nutshell, proposes that, uh, and I'm not going to go too far into that, we can talk about that another time, what he, what all his theory is, but... Um, around 40,000 years ago, Homo sapien almost became extinct. And he quotes numbers and, and all that in his book. But something happened where they turned the tables. And he's saying that it was Neanderthals that were preying on humans. Um, and, and I think it was more our creatures than Neanderthals. And if that was the case, you know, whatever psychological trauma changed us to become more aggressive or maybe we were already aggressive and and they just got uh, um, a little tougher and turned the tables so if if that happened 40,000 years ago there would really be no record if we thought we exterminated the creatures that were preying on us Um, you know as a species we would have simply forgotten and there would be no kind of record out there of them Um, so it was interesting that they talk about uh, this human um, development 
and the smaller brain developed around 20,000 years ago, mm-hmm. which would mean that this domestic self-domestication would have already been, been going on since they went through that big traumatic event. I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, yeah, no, that is kind of interesting. Um, so what he's saying, if I understand correctly, is that we sort of voluntarily... Yeah, what he's saying is that... Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to follow my own train of thought here. <laughs> well, here's, here's, what it, here's what... There's a Duke anthropologist by the name of Brian Hare argues that humans unintentionally experienced a similar process that left us more cooperative than are now extinct human cousins like Neanderthals and Denisovans. So in order to survive... You know, if we had to survive you know, a really traumatic thing like near extinction because of predation... We had to become more cooperative, and that also that would have triggered this self uh, domestication syndrome. And when they talk about you know teeth yeah. sizes, and I think he they mentioned that farther in here, they talk about the physical things. Yeah, it says that um, modern humans exhibit a number of domesticated traits, including reduced brains during the last fifty thousand years, changes in dentition, and reduction of aggressiveness. And he also says retention of juvenile characteristics and i'm not sure what those characteristics are though well the juvenile characteristics i was going to speak to because in domesticating animals that's what you're talking about as far as the cranial changes and such um because uh it's kind of like with cats which uh tom and i are quite familiar with uh with the domestication of the cat it's like um you know, when cats or kittens, their their faces are flatter, they're cuter. So this is how we have developed, this is why we have developed some of these breeds of cats with the flatter faces, the more infantile look, because we think it's cute. And this could be the same thing that you're referring to in humans um, that, you know, one one look might be more appealing over another look and that was you know and that individual is going to certainly be uh, and those type of traits in an individual are certainly going to be more uh selected by a mate if they find it more attractive now however i i would tend to disagree about the uh that the neanderthals were hunting the uh, homo sapiens at this point in time which yeah i don't think they were either I, I think it was. I, I, I think it was our so. creatures. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I think that if that was the case, that I, if if I was a homo, homo sapien at that point in time, and a female, I'd be looking for the biggest and the bravest and the meanest a man out there for, uh, for my mate. You know, that was going to defend me, not somebody that's going to be some docile, uh, you know, creature. So, uh, I, I, I just find that I would definitely disagree with uh, that mode of thinking i think there was something environmentally that was happening at that point in time that brought a, uh brought around this uh you know change and and people and um I, I had briefly heard about this uh domestication syndrome but it wasn't something that was even ever brought up when I went to school. And I just, like I said, I just briefly had heard about it here recently. And then you found that article and sent it to me. And I was like, hmm. Um, but now, um, the, but, see, people saying that the bonobos self-domesticate. How did they self-domesticate uh, themselves? Somebody, somebody explain that one to me. Uh, because, oh, David, are you there? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, Forrest. Whoever's there, I can't hear you because this is actually my voicemail. <laughs> gotcha. Leave a message, and I'll call you back. Thanks. Uh-oh. Let me... Okay. At sorry the tone, about, please sorry record about your message. <laughs> when you finish recording, you may Why hang up or press noise. 1 for more options. Oh, to leave man. a callback number, Oops. press 5. Hold on. I lost force. Hold on, guys. We're having some issues, minor issues here. Let's bring Forrest back on. Okay, it's calling. And it. Sorry, Forrest. We lost you there for a minute. Hello? 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 
because oh, you didn't we're back to David. Whoever's there, I can't hear you. Uh, oh, okay, this hold on. Actually, my voice. Okay. <laughs> Dave, my cousin David's going to. Okay, hold on a second, guys. Sorry about that, folks. We're uh, we're having editing. A little, we're we're having a little. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to edit this, but. Uh, I thought maybe you didn't like what I was saying, so you just disconnected no, me. No, <laughs> no, the doggone thing. I. Okay, you know, no, I totally, I totally agree with you about Neanderthals. I do not believe I, you know, read Vendramini's book. I don't believe it's Neanderthal. I think it's the Sasquatch, and the reason I say that is because, um, and, and here's a couple things. Okay, hold on. Um, number one. Of course, you know, Neanderthals bred with Homo sapiens because we have their DNA. So there couldn't have been too much animosity going on there. Uh, really? <laughs> Neanderthals vanished for no reason. Well, what if some other species was preying on both them and us? They wiped out Neanderthals because they weren't as cooperative as Homo sapiens were. And that cooperation or self-domestication or what led to self-domestication uh, is what overcame them. They felt that they wiped out their enemies, so they summarily, as a species, forgot them. That's why today we don't believe we don't believe they exist. Well, I could I could agree with you uh, to a certain degree on that one, but I think that now this is my mode of thinking, and I may be totally on the the wrong path here, but I think that. Uh, of course, you know, I believe that Neanderthals st still exist in certain areas. I think they're still out there and hidden probably because they know how humans are, uh, our dear old Homo sapiens sapiens. But um, I think that it may have more to do with the fact that you have a group of people, Neanderthals, that are hunting primarily large, um, these large uh, herbivores and they they pretty much live the typical paleo diet of uh, meat. Uh, I'm sure that there was some uh, gathering of uh, types of plants and stuff like that, but uh, uh, not to the degree that uh, maybe you saw in the Homo sapiens uh, sapiens that were coming up. Um, and I think maybe they their their dependence upon the large uh, herbivores that disappeared after the glacial period. Uh, your mammoths, I mean, we have evidence that they were hunting mammoths and rhinos and, and the large uh, uh, bison and the large cattle um, that existed at that point in time. And then these, they just basically disappeared. So I think the fact that they, that they lost a food source I think brought about their de more of their demise than anything else, probably, because well, obviously we wouldn't be we wouldn't be t here today exhibiting uh, features <laughs> that are basically ne Neanderthals: the fair skin, the blue and the green eyes, the red hair. I mean, you and I both have discussed how much uh, you know. Uh, well, all of us have, for that matter. Uh, these. Neanderthal type features, uh, so there obviously was interbreeding going on between uh, people, and 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 then too, a lot of times when you have all this interbreeding going on, you sometimes dilute the gene pool, and then some genes just fade away into non-existence, and then others, uh, those that are more prepotent, uh, carry on. So, uh, I mean, that's just my idea. I think there was a lot of uh, type of environmental situations that. Uh, that uh, brought about the demise of uh, your Denisovians and your uh, Neanderthals. So, fellas, what do you guys think? My... Well, I think it's as uh, as good of a theory as any. Actually, I mean, you know, it's uh, we, you know, we dig up the bones, we get the evidence. And, um, yeah, I'm down with that. Well, Neanderthals exhibited a, 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 a developed social order. 
as well as Homo sapiens. I mean, uh, the burial of their dead and the fact that they left grave goods in the, the, the graves of their dead, and there's evidence that they took care of elderly in their groups. So they had a, quite a bit of a, a developed social order. So, um, you know, I... I just, I wonder sometimes if, um, you know, going back to this uh, infantile parents that, uh, you know, we have, you know, humans, homo sapiens, Neanderthals had a more, uh, uh, had more prognathism in their face than what we do. And they had the, the larger brow ridges. And they had a sloping forehead. Um, we don't have any of that. What we have is a face that progressively uh, has moved under our cranium and our frontal area. And uh, uh, they also didn't have a chin. We do. And we have a more flattened face. Do you call that maybe or refer that to that maybe more of as an infantile appearance versus what the appearance that they had? So um, I'm just still pondering over this, uh, that they say that bonobos have a (laughs) self-inflicted domestication. Well, If that was the case, then maybe humans have a self-inflicted domestication. Well, no, that's that's exactly what they're saying. And and because it's not just humans or bonobos, they're talking about all sorts of different animal species that exhibit exactly the same traits uh, that have this. Uh, And also plants, but plants, of course, are a little bit different. But but, um, that's what they're saying with the reduced brain size and and all these other traits, that these are self-induced and unintentionally self-induced, but they're self-induced domestication syndrome. So back to the original thought is, you know, is that what we're looking at? Why, you know, why the Sasquatch is more aggressive now? because we're still continuing down that road towards it or on this self-domestication. I mean, we see a lot of times and a lot of people may not like it, but you know, we hear the term beta male more and more in, in our society uh, because, you know, men are really younger men anywhere becoming me- uh, less aggressive. Well, yes, but is that, uh, it, it, that is really uh, they're choosing that not necessarily a societal choosing i mean uh of course i go back to the old thing i think most women prefer a man manly man uh versus uh you know what we have appearing on the scene now but uh uh, maybe that's just me maybe i'm weird but uh um you know i guess that's what happens when you get older but uh um that I think it could be entirely correct as far as, you know, the, the beta male syndrome. Um, there's a lot of things that are changing in our society today that I don't see for the good. I mean, if we're, we're going to, I mean, I don't believe in aggression, but, I mean, if we get to the point that we're just so passive that we roll over for anything and everybody, I mean, where, where are we going to go as a species? Well, and we're going to die off. And it's not so much against each other that I'm talking about is, you know, how, how nature uh, reacts to us. You know, we, we had a very dominant role for centuries. And then in the past few decades, that's had a big reversal. And, and the creatures, um, you know, they respond to that. For years, they stayed kind of out of sight, out of mind, I think out of fear of us. Uh, but they're not anymore. Well, I, I think I think we're entire. We've we discussed this, and I think you're entirely correct because, uh, uh, I mean, we're not out there hunting like we used to, and for whatever reason that is, uh, I don't know whether it's that uh, there's a lot of prohibitions being put on hunting now, and um, and then the COVID thing came along, and we saw the peculiarities of the way animals were acting that they were literally walking down these vacant streets of towns looking in the the windows like they were window shopping but they i know that they were looking for where did the humans go to you know and um i mean it's just a natural reaction i think that they would uh uh wonder and and the same token bigfoot would take advantage of that situation 
I mean, they're a big brain primate. They're going to take advantage of that situation. Chuck, what do you think? Well, I was sitting here thinking about some of this, and and I think a lot of it has to do with selectivity. I mean, I I mean, you look at the you look at weightlifters and stuff like that. I mean, those guys are full of testosterone, and I think a lot of that plays into uh, kind of what we're talking about. I mean, not necessarily that. You know, yeah. Did did you say something about that? the testosterone levels were lower they're lower than, yeah than what they, well uh, there's you know there's a lot of guys that y- you go uh to weight rooms and stuff like that there's a lot of guys that are taking testosterone and it, it probably and does make them more aggressive than than other males who are not i would think and, so yeah so i'm wondering if you know, is that part of the game as well? Okay, we should be. As long as I can figure this out, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring my cousin David on. <laughs> you don't have the worst time with Skype, I'm telling you guys. <laughs> okay, let's see. Where are we at? Oh, here we go. Uh, no, that's not it. Well, let's just go ahead and keep talking then until I can figure out how to bring him on here. Oh, here we go. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, no, I agree entirely. Um, it it absolutely does uh, testosterone, whether you get an abundance of it or you get it taken away, um, you know, that there are some medications to lower, to reduce it. Um, I would absolutely agree that it, it is going to make you more aggressive. Not necessarily in the sense that, you know, you're just out of control, but um, yeah, it absolutely does. Well, it's going to make you more aggressive or a tendency. It's going to give you a tendency towards that. See, David, are you there with us? I can't tell. Okay, maybe not yet. I'm still working on it. So it's an interesting thought. And, um, no. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting from the standpoint of, uh, um, you know, looking at what's going on, because we've talked about all these differences, and, you know, we talked about, of course, and Forrest brought up a great point, you know, the older juveniles that are kind of raising or caring for the younger juveniles. In a lot of places, you know, we see where footprints are being found in the past two, three years, lots and lots of juvenile tracks, and different sizes of juvenile tracks, you know, together. And it's kind of curious to the adults seem to be not entirely missing, but they're not leaving the prints out where they're being found as much as the juveniles are. So, to me, that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a behavioral change, I think. Yeah, it is, and they're it's it's almost as if they're abdicating their position, you know, in in in, in the group. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, David. Hey, what's up, boys? Well, Forrest, David, and Forrest Chuck, Mario. and Tom are here. <laughs> what's up, guys? Oh, we're here. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, doing T. You all right? Hanging in there. Good. Well, we're just... I had you Skype so long, fellas, so, you know, bear with me. Not a problem. We're just, we're just in a process. We were discussing uh, something called domestication syndrome earlier, but... We're talking about behavior with the creatures right. and people and sort of how it's changed. We A lot of people have been noting the changes in the past. Oh, I mean, it, everybody thinks it's recently, but it's really been the past several years. You mean as far as like the aggressiveness of them towards people? Or well, that's part of it. Overall. It's also, 
just a lot of differences. I mean, like, we'll see... It used to be, they would go back to the 60s, and I'm going to use Bluff Creek as an example because they would find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tracks in a, in a single line, which you would expect if you're going to find tracks, right. you'll find them in, in like that. And then after the flurry of activity of people going out looking at this stuff and looking for these things, then it kind of tapered off. I mean, they were, they're still being found, but, or maybe at least it just didn't make the news like it had been. Um you know, then you get all these people that find, you know, maybe, you know, a few tracks. Uh, and I always thought that was curious. You'd only find a few tracks when you should find a whole line of prints if something actually made those tracks. Uh, or even one right. or, even one or two. But now we, we've got people like Annabeth in Central Texas on Christmas that in that particular location, and it was real grassy outside that area, so I think, and, and I don't know that she you know wanted to go further than she did but she counted around 200 tracks in that particular line uh and that was one individual is that all yeah, well that's actually yeah that was actually a pretty good one um but yeah i mean there, there were probably much more she just didn't look um you know the casual person goes out and looks for stuff you know they're not going to think to oh i'm going to follow this line of tracks for eight miles or something you know what i mean <laughs> right and Forrest, you've yeah, had well, tracks right in your right corral back there. To the cave and go in the cave. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> or when they stopped right. suddenly and disappeared, they went up a tree. Well, you know what? It's interesting. In, in one of the videos that she sent me, she went out and followed the tracks after my suggesting, you know, she go out and video those. And she did a great job videoing the tracks. Um, she thought they vanished at one point. Well, you're looking, you're, you're looking at the video and, and at, down at the footprints, you know, at her feet. Well, yes, it, you know, if you didn't look around, it would appear that the tracks ended, but they made a bizarre left turn. It was like, it was more than 90 degrees. It was a really sharp turn with yeah. that, without missing a step, by the way. Yeah, because these things meander, they just go all over the place. Yeah, I found I found lots of tracks in places where they were just helter skelter. There wasn't a, even a particular line of tracks; they were just all over the damn place. Yeah. yeah, like they were just meandering back and forth and here and there, and made me kind of wonder what the heck they were up to. But uh, you know, I guess if you're looking for food, I've or never whatever. seen them go. In, I've never seen them go on a straight line unless they have spotted something and they're going after it. You've you found lines of tracks there, right? Yeah. Well, tell us about that. And the ones up, the ones up in the UP, you would find because there was so much deer up there. That would be the only time you would find a line of straight tracks, and you'd follow them, and you'd see where a deer was. That's some deer. That's well, some guys too, David. Deer print. You had some experiences in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. You want to tell the guys about that? Yeah, I was up there for a few years. Um, I lived outside of Marquette in Nagani. Will, did you get a chance to take a look at the uh, area when I sent you the address? I didn't yet. I'm going to this weekend, though. Okay, it's, it's pretty remote. Um, up there, we had, we literally had Sasquatch crossing signs on the roads. That's how active the area was. But out of towners, they always thought it was a joke. Well, it, it wasn't a joke. Um, we would have them come up behind the house during the winter um, a lot. Like they were just checking out the area because we had deer in our front yard all the time. We'd have deer come up on the front porch. That's how much we had out there. And there was one who would come around every night between 10 and 2 a.m. And he would come up to the back of the house where the master bedroom is and he would just slap on the side of the house like as hard as he could and there would be times we'd hear him up on the roof running across the roof and jump off the other side and you just hear a loud thud and a shake it, it would vibrate everything when it landed but it would come up to the back of the house slap up along the roof and this thing had to be at least 10 foot tall because up around the eave, it was basically about 12 foot from the ground to the eave. And it would slap like several times. And I knew what it was. So I wasn't about to look out in the windows. Um, but 
a lot of the times they would chase the deer in that area because they were so abundant and it's just very remote that there hardly anybody lives back there on the road i lived on there was maybe three houses including mine and it was all woods all forest really really thick and we found tracks back in the woods behind our house these tracks were like 18 inches long about seven and a half inches wide and they would meander all through the woods but the times that i would find a straight line and follow it it would always end where deer prints were and the spacing between the tracks was probably 12 feet between each track so you could tell they were running i mean they were making a beeline to this thing but we had people out there that would see him. Uh, Will, didn't you get a picture from a game camera from up there? Not a game that camera. One? It was an actual <laughs> witness who took the picture. Okay. Yeah, from that so region. I couldn't remember if it was a game camera or actual witness. But, yeah, they're, they're all over the place up there. I mean, it was nothing ever, you know, terrifying or exciting that happened. But we knew what it was because you would see the tracks the next day in the snow when the slapping occurred the night before or early that morning but they always came around at the same time um i knew to ignore it you know not to go out and try and see what was going on to egg them on or whatever you want to call it but i ignored it they would come around for a couple hours why they got up on the roof i have no idea but you could tell it was one of the, you could hear the roof creaking from the weight and there was a couple of times I thought it was going to fall through and it'd be right there in my living room. Where where we hear that but before, guys? It, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Forrest, you had something on your roof, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that's why I was laughing. Um, here, what was it, two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> I'm not rem- I'm trying to remember. Chuck, was it you that I was talking to at the time? And I, I was like, I, my, oh, my God, it sounds like I got a horse on the roof. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah. I was. I was. It on the started phone with from the other happened. side of it. It started from the other side of the trailer, and then ran back towards the master bedroom, and then, and then it just, it, it, it like, and it. I guess you know, I didn't even think about this. It must have jumped off back here, uh, because uh, I never heard it again. It didn't run back the other way. The see, four years did the exact opposite. Mine would start at the master bedroom and run towards the living room. <clears throat> no, I, I was sitting in the master bedroom, and uh, uh, it it started at the other end of the house, and then came uh, came down here, and then that that was the last I heard of it. So it had to have jumped. And you know what? I didn't even think about that, but that it just jumped off the roof is what exactly what it did. I was thinking it, uh, you know, uh, would have gone back down to the trees, but it just came off the end of the. The roof is what it had to have done. And there were some differences, so. too, for us. I think you probably had that juvenile that you saw. And, David, you had an adult. 18-inch tracks comes <clears throat> out to a 9-foot, nine 9-inch nine creature. That's that's pretty substantial. Yeah, if it was a juvenile, he was heavy. <laughs> well, this, this was – I don't think this was an adult. I, it had to have been a juvenile. But, you know, I've been having some uh, mysterious little uh, – uh, goings on around here for a while and then when Jessica and I saw that juvenile in the middle of the road it was just like oh my gosh you know okay <laughs> we, we uh, saw course, the do you think it was the juvenile center. huh do you think it was do you think it was the juvenile up on your roof yes I do I don't it wasn't it didn't sound like a a, a, a heavy male or female up there no it, it was a it was a kid running around. And she just saw a Juvenile not long before that on the road. It yeah, that's what I was wondering. That. <clears throat> yeah. Me and Jessica coming home at 11.15 at night, sitting right in the freaking middle of the, the farm-to-market road out here. Yeah. Hmm. Chuck, how many times have you heard stories of these things on roofs? Uh, quite a few times. That's that seems to be. I mean, I'm hearing that. I mean, I've interviewed people in the past that said that, but you know, back then I'm thinking, well, maybe this is more an anomaly than a normal occurrence. But these days, I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a little bit more of a uh, a normal occurrence in their behavior. 
Well, you well, know, primates primates do that all the time out, and uh, especially out in Southeast Asia, they get up on people's roofs and run around and get into all sorts of mischief, swing from the electrical lines and get electrocuted, and uh, you know. I would so, suppose from I, it's an innate behavior, you know, wanting to be up high, you know, to stay away from predators yeah. or what have you. Yeah, primates when like high. It, when it did it on my roof, I would sometimes wonder if it wasn't spotting a deer and going after it from the roof, you know, a better vantage point, because when it, it would take off across that roof and you would hear it when it landed. And we would have deer in our yard during the day, during the night, and I, I couldn't ever figure out why in the world it would get up there in the middle of the night and just, I mean, what's the point, you know? Here's the thought, too. If it's up higher like that, I wonder um, if it would be less um, sensible by the game animals. In other words, would a deer smell it more on the ground than it would if it were up high? Or would That's that, what or would, I was thinking. Or would it make a difference? It, well, I was thinking if, if it's up high on the roof, the deer is not going to look up at the roof. And it could sneak up on it, literally. So, so I figured that would be the only thing that made sense as to why they did that. They were trying to see if they could find deer, sneak up on it somehow, and then pounce. What do you think, Because Because this would always happen... When this was going on, I mean, this was like during the winter time, and up in the UP, to give y'all an example, when it snowed, it snowed in November, the first week of November back in, I think it was either 2015 or 16, uh, I had come down here to visit family, then I went back up. Four hours after I got back home there, we had a snowstorm roll in, and within four hours, we had four and a half feet of snow. And that snow, I'm thinking, if they're trying to sneak up on something at night, especially a deer, that snow's going to be crunching. That deer's going to hear something coming. It's going to take off. So why not get on the roof where it can't see you and have less of a chance of hearing you take off and then pounce on it? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Uh, strategically, you know, you're, you've got a high elevation. You can see long distances you can prepare in advance so sure yeah that makes plenty of sense that's pretty strong that's I think I could <laughs> yeah well yeah, there you yeah, go sometimes it it did sound like it wasn't gonna hold up and i got a little nervous yeah i can imagine thank goodness for good construction huh right <laughs> <laughs> yeah you wouldn't want that to drop through the ceiling nope I'd be like, I'd be gone. hello hello <laughs> Me and, me and the cats would be out the, out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> I'd throw down a ham sandwich and run. Well, Chuck, you've heard quite a well, few of those stories. As I mean, long as you want the ham sandwich. <laughs> did, did any, <laughs> exactly. Chuck, did any of those witnesses ever have any idea why the things were on their roofs? I was just wondering if there were any, any differences in behaviors. Oh, Chuck's muted. Um, well, I don't know. That's a good question, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm just why? just kind of wondering. I mean, you know, aside from hunting or whatever, I mean, if they weren't hunting, hunting what are they doing up there? You know, and are exactly. they, are they yeah. ever messing with the, the occupants of the house? I think that's probably part of it. See if they can draw somebody outside, see how many people's in there. Like when they slap the house. Yep, that's definitely one of the things they're doing when they do that. I don't know. Any other weird behaviors you guys can think of that we've heard of? And, I mean, that's that's an odd one to me. But, you know, I do agree with Forrest. You know, it is a natural. It's a thing primates do. So I guess we shouldn't not expect them to do things like that. But what about other outbuildings? Yeah, I mean? Most primates don't slap houses, though. That's true. Yeah, they're, they're definitely trying to elicit something from us when they're doing that. Um, I'm wondering, too, about other outbuildings. Let's say you've got a farm somewhere, a ranch. You know, are they getting up on the roofs of barns and outbuildings? And, um, you 
we hear about him getting in chicken coops and things like that. I don't see why they wouldn't. There was, I think it's just reported more with houses because people are always in the house. There, there was one person that made a comment after one of the last um, shows we talked about. Remember I told you guys about uh, my friend that had the uh, rabbits in the really heavily built cages attached to their house? And, and this person responded that, oh, raccoons will do that. Uh, I'm here to tell you that was absolutely no raccoon that did that. These things were torn apart, and I mean torn apart. Um, there is no raccoon, no, no small animal like that is going to be able to rip that kind of, uh, and I'm sure whoever, the person or that, I can't remember offhand, I didn't make a note of the person's um, screen name to, to address them specifically, but um, number one, the mesh was, it was really heavy gauge mesh. It wasn't this cheap stuff you see out there now. It was really heavy gauge um, and I almost want to say it was stainless steel, but it was, you know, something kind of like that. And it was grabbed, the, the holes were poked through it like fingers. They were big, you could tell that it looked like fingers that had been poked through that mesh. And then like you would crush your hand with the stuff in it. And then it was ripped. The bottom of the cages were ripped out. Um, and I mean, I'm, wasn't it ripped away from the house? It was, it was, the cages were built, they were attached to the house. I think they actually nailed them to the, yeah. the house was old, so they you know they actually nailed them to the side of the house, and they were built out of two by six boards, and this really heavy gauge steel mesh, and some you could tell something had reached up underneath, poked its fingers through the gate the mesh, closed its hand, crushing part of that, and then it ripped it pulled out the mesh. So that along two axes, along two sides, where it was attached to the, um, and what they did was they they had two. If you took two by um, two by sixes, they were like sandwiched. Okay, so you have one two by six. They'd have the the mesh that was stapled to one of those boards, and then another two by six on top of that. So that was how the framing was built. So that when when the tear the tear occurred, it was along, you know, the side where. Uh, the mesh came out of the uh, two by six and it was ripped straight on two sides for about two and a half feet. There was, that was not, a, that was not a uh, raccoon. Sorry, folks. <laughs> it was something entirely different. I'll be back. Okay. Not sure who that was. Well, but, well yeah, that's, a, that's a mighty big yeah. raccoon. Yeah, right. I mean, come on now. That was no raccoon. You know, I mean, I understand somebody suggesting that, but uh, I was there and saw it, and that was absolutely nothing like that. I want to say, what's that? You guys were talking over each other. No, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Forrest. Well, I was just going to say, I don't think I ever told you guys. Uh, if I have, then tell me uh, that I have about uh, my when I had I had chickens out here, and this happened. This was the first thing that ever, and I was actually thinking about it the other night, and I thought, I couldn't remember if I'd ever told you all about this. But I have a chicken house that my grandfather built, and it's been there for, uh, gosh, probably 100 years there now. He built it out of railroad ties. Um, and the front of it has, is, has been replaced, and it's regular, but it was replaced with regular chicken wire. You know what I'm talking about when I say regular yeah, chicken right, wire. Right. Okay. Um, and it, I've never had, had never had raccoons or anything like that ever get in, get in there. And these chickens were actually, uh, my daughter's chickens and, uh, she had gone off and left a uh, half a dozen chickens there. And I said, that's fine. I'll take care of them. That's no problem. So, uh, they went out during the day and they always went up at night, locked them up. I locked them up every night. I came home one day and one morning and the front of the chicken wire was ripped up and had this big gaping hole in it. I mean, big gaping hole. And something had literally ripped it apart. And, of course, I got that same thing from everybody. Oh, it was just raccoons. It was just <laughs> raccoons. Well, now, it's chicken wire, yes. But I don't even think the raccoons could have ripped a hole that big. And why would they have ripped? A raccoon's not 
is not going to need a three foot hole to climb through. No, you know. And uh, so, why would a raccoon do that? Oh, it must have been a bobcat. I'm like going, no, a bobcat wouldn't have needed a big hole like that. No. And I've never seen a bobcat ever take and rip anything open like that. Usually a predator well, just, will make just a, a hole just big enough for them to get through and pull out the prey. Pull out, yes. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, and in two days' time, all the chickens were gone. Wow. Two days' time. The first night there was three, and the next night there was three. Well, Tom, and <laughs> you, you remember, Tom, last summer when we were in the field, um, there was a part of the forest uh, up there that had one of these experimental forest things where they have pig wire. They have, yeah, it, have, it, yeah, fenced, have it fenced off with pig wire and fence posts. So we were looking at it, and, you know, there were places you could see where a deer or elk had hopped over the fence and maybe hit it, so they were sagging a little bit in places. And, and what was that fence, Tom, probably six, seven feet high? Uh, it was easily, yeah, because yeah. it came up to your chin. Yeah, right. You are what, so, six foot so there five? Was, right. So there was one place, and remember what I talked about with the rabbit cages, how, you know, something had obviously, with a hand, had poked its fingers through that mesh because the holes yep. were like two inches across and they were spaced like a hand. There were five holes. And then whatever this hand had closed, crushing that mesh and then pulling the wire. Well, we found a place very similar to that on this pig wire where a section of it had been grasped and crushed like a hand, a large hand would do. And it was pulled lengthwise and ripped apart that way the entire fence was ripped apart yeah yeah that was, was. that was not a raccoon folks well <laughs> the, uh, and we, 950 pounds and yeah we've eight and a half foot we've got that raccoon. all on film yeah <laughs> it was a squirrel and everybody knows oh it. of course a dang big squirrel <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my was, Ricky's a pretty big raccoon, but she's not that that strong. <laughs> but I mean, you know, there are things like that that you can see that number one, a hand did it. You know, if it were paws or claws or hoofs or something like that, that's an entirely different kind of destruction to to wire fencing. Um, exactly. You know, when it's crushed into this small, you know, section and you know pulled. That can only be done by hand, right? Well, I'm I'm back now, and sorry I had a l delay. I had a big knock on my door. Oh, no problem. But, um, I I got two stories that I can relate to to what you guys were are talking about. Yeah, great, great. I uh, <clears throat> here and here where I live, uh, they have an elk's lodge here. And uh, this has been probably maybe four or five years ago. I remember uh, a guy, he's now deceased, but I remember a guy talking about um, he saw one night he was driving home and uh, saw, he said there were monkeys on top of the Elks Lodge. And uh, <laughs> I said, no, nah, that, there ain't no monkeys out there. Um but I know what it is. And, uh, that, that was one of the stories that I got here in town locally, uh, was about that particular incident. And then one of my research buddies that I, I do research with, uh, he lives out in Elk city, which is kind of out West of me, uh, pretty good ways. But he had, uh, he had a dog kennel, uh, and well, it wasn't a kennel. It was a, he had a dog house in there, but it was a chain link fence. But on the top of that chain link fence, he had a, one of those, um, it wasn't aluminum. It was a little bit heavier duty, uh, pole that ran across the top rung of the chain link. And, um, it, his dog did some really strange things. Um, he, he, he was noticing that his dog was, going through about 50 pounds of dog food a week and um uh, and his dog wasn't getting any bigger and um he finally found out 
what was going on because his dog ended up digging a hole in the ground and pushing the food bowl into where this hole was and then co- covered it up with dirt. And he noticed uh, one afternoon he went out there and where that that pipe was on the top rail of the chain link, it looked like something had taken its hand and shoved that down toward the ground. And you could actually see the indentions of where the fingers actually pushed the bar down. You could see the the implants of, of the fingers on this on this pipe, it shoved it all the way down to the ground. And, um, you know, it, that's pretty heavy duty pipe, you know, for not, for having, having it to be bent like that. And you can actually see where the finger, where the fingers actually pushed it down on the ground, uh, to get, get into the dog pen to get to the dog, the dog food. Yeah, it's it, there's some interesting things that go on like that. I mean, it's at first sometimes you know for somebody who doesn't know or isn't familiar with these different kinds of things to assume it's some normal animal, but you know when you look at some of these really um, I, I call them bizarre finds, you know like like my friend's rabbit cages or what we found in July, you know or what you're talking about with this bar, um, it goes above and beyond any normal animal's capabilities of doing these things. Right. It, it you know, it took a lot of strength for, for that thing to, to put finger indentions in that pipe. And they were, they were huge. I actually That's saw a strong picture. grip. Any, any that's idea? That's a very strong. Yeah, that's a very strong grip. Any idea what that pipe's made out of, Chuck? Well, you know, most of the time they put like aluminum, the aluminum pipe on, on, on the top rail. But in this particular instance, he put some heavy duty pipe in there. It wasn't, it wasn't aluminum at all. It was, it was steel. But it actually, you could actually see the hand, the finger impressions where it shoved the, the pipe down to the ground just so he could get in there and, to get the dog food. Mm. Well, isn't, isn't it made out of a galvanized, uh, some type of galvanized metal? Are you talking about chain link? Yes, that's exactly what it was. It was galvanized. You know, that kind of makes me think about uh, Tom. Remember Jason in Arizona? He sent us pictures of uh, he had a chain link fence by his home and. Uh, one of the posts, I think it was mounted in concrete. At least it was bolted to concrete, but that was ripped out. <laughs> the the, the, mount, yeah, the mounting right. post. I, I picked, you, you sent me pictures where it's actually ripped out of its mounting, and the creatures were there. So, what did that? <laughs> well, it wasn't. How did they do it? It, it wasn't a raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> it was a squirrel. 1500 pound raccoon. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, now you guys are blaming the raccoons. First the bear, then now it's the raccoons. Oh, it is the raccoons. Yeah, We've known bird. it all along. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody gets a share of the blame, you know. <laughs> it couldn't be big. It's everything, everyone but Sasquatch. Which is, you know, the cul- the culprit. <laughs> They're blameless. That's because they don't exist. Oh, of course. (laughs) Oh, heavens to Betsy. Yeah, don't don't believe all of us here that have seen them. (laughs) Right. We know down south of me there is a a town called El Reno, and uh, back in the late seventies, early eighties, I think, uh, there was a, a report going through the newspaper about uh, people were calling this thing the chicken man and uh, it was actually uh, pretty close to to uh, one of the rivers the Canadian River and where this farm was 
and uh, this guy was uh, losing chickens right and left. And uh, that kind of goes back to what what Forrest was talking about. And you know, there, there was there was a big outcry about that. They said some guy was in there going in there and taking all the chickens. I I have a different chicken man story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had I couldn't resist when I was in the army back in the late seventies, stationed in Germany. We had this guy um, who was trying to get thrown out of the army, so he was trying to, you know, make everybody convinced he was crazy. So he would get up on top of the barracks at two in the morning and crow. <laughs> so they called him Chicken Man. <laughs> <laughs> it it didn't work for him. They call him Corporal Cleaner. It, it didn't work for him. <laughs> <laughs> he had the he had the Cleaner syndrome. <laughs> well, he thought he did, but right now the guy was goofy. I'll give you that, but he wasn't nuts. <laughs> I mean, gee, come up with a better plan oh, than that. <laughs> did, did he come from Toledo, Ohio, or <laughs> you know, I'm not sure where he was from. I don't think I ever wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> but no that's you know in yeah. places they they will take animals they'll they get a fixation on something and they'll clear an area out of whatever it is they're eating well i wasn't happy about losing the chickens but i guess better the chickens than my cats <laughs> well you've noted the same thing with deer right if they sort of yeah. all vanish the area well, I, I did tell Tom that I said uh, this last week, uh, Jessica and I happened to be going into town, and it was, um, we got up to the top of the driveway getting ready to pull out on the farm to market road here, and <clears throat> all of a sudden my, my, my headlights actually caught deer standing out in the hayfield, and we hadn't seen them, I mean, and forever out there, and... Uh, we actually, I, I, we now carry a spotlight in the car all the time. So uh, we picked up the spotlight and we're actually spotlighting the deer across the road to see. And we counted six deer standing there. So I guess they're coming back, but I haven't seen any in my pasture though. Hmm. Well, I guess it. Is it black tail or white tail or what? what oh, what we only matter? have white tail in this area. You do? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we don't have any black tail or mule deer or anything like that here. I guess it'd be a matter of figuring out where the creatures are kind of uh, hanging out. Well, that you know, that night when we saw that juvenile, it was coming from the direction of that post oak uh, ranch over there, and it was their hay fields that we saw the 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 deer in. So uh, I think that uh, they spent a lot of time hanging out over there. And, and, of course, I'm not saying that they don't hang out in the cedar breaks in the back of my property, but I'm not going to go back there looking for them. You know, deer are kind of habitual about their feeding areas, too. So, um, yeah, they I'm sure they're observing them and knowing where they're coming to feed. Yeah, oh, I, for sure. So I, I'm hoping that maybe the Bigfoot have moved out of the area for a while but it's possible you know. well if the deer moved temporarily they were going to follow them too yeah so if the deer are back unfortunately your guests may be back too oh thanks thanks will <laughs> that made me feel <laughs> but remember it's raccoons i, I know i know 850 pound raccoons yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm telling ricky to go on the diet i'm putting on her diet <laughs> She's not going to be a happy raccoon. <laughs> she licks her peanuts and raisins. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we're getting short on time. Any uh, any final thoughts or anything? Well, this has been interesting. Well, going back to uh, what we originally started with, uh, with the behavior patterns that, that people are seeing and and we're noticing it could be that the uh the older males are are losing their testosterone and these uh younger ones are coming in and uh they're they have a whole lot more testosterone than than what the older ones do now 
that could be part of the issue that's that's taken place. Yeah, I think you're right, and and it could be, uh, you know, it might not be just one or one or two here and there. It could be across the board. I mean, we don't know anything about their, you know, what the population makeup is or their breeding patterns or any of that kind of stuff. So it could be a whole new generation, all you know, at one time, sort of coming into their own. Well, we'll wrap it up with that and um, visit us next time, folks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.